Um, so today we have the pleasure to have uh, Dr. Wei Xu Chu um, from the uh, veterinary school uh, here today. Uh, so he, uh, Wei Xu got his uh, bachelor's degree at Harvard in physics and then went on to Princeton to get a PhD in physics also. Uh, after that he uh, went and worked for the government, uh, mostly for the EPA, the Environmental Protective Agency, for a number of years. Uh, where he worked as an environmental health scientist and a supervisory physical scientist. Uh, and then he recently moved um, here to Texas a and as um, a professor in what's in the veterinary sciences. So, uh, thank you. Thanks, Andrew, for the invitation, and uh, Dan for being in contact with us. Uh, and you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and while I was at EPA, I never flew first class, so I don't know. <laughs> private jet? <laughs> Military jets, private jets? No, I never did any of that. So, um, so you know, my kind of my talk today is what's a business doing in a vet school, and you know, basically the the meta message of my entire talk is you never know where a physics degree might take you. Um, so I'm going to start with you know how did I get here? So I'm going to go into basically half the talk is going to be about you know, going into a little bit more detail about making this transition, you know, where I started out, you know, doing astrophysics, uh, how I ended up here uh, at Texas A&M. Uh, and then the second half will be more into, like, what am I actually doing now um, in terms of computational modeling and really helping to support uh, both better supporting and supporting better uh, environmental health decisions and ultimately to try to protect human health and the environment. And I'll have a few concluding remarks with some unsolicited advice for uh, these people. And, uh, those things. All right. So the quickie version is that I started out. I grew up in Maryland. Um, had a summer, you know, job at, at Goddard. Um, did you know some work there? Uh, helped me get into you know Harvard in terms of getting a, a, PhD, a, a, a bachelor's in physics there, which uh, and then a PhD at Princeton. Um, and then I you know made this jump to the U.S. General Accounting Office. So this is now called the Government Accountability Office, uh, doing uh, some work that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, from there, I transitioned to the US EPA, um, which was just sort of you know, a few blocks away. Uh, that was actually, my office was across the river in Virginia. Um, so I'd never really gone south of northern Virginia until then I came here to Texas a um, So the, I sort of divide this up into two phases. First is sort of the physics, astrophysics, astronomy phase. Um, and then the second is sort of the science policy, risk assessment, environmental health, uh, sciences phase, and then there's the sort of dual personality period in between, which was the sort of the transition. So I'm going to start with, um, uh, you know, start at the beginning, you know, back in, uh, in uh, sort of the high school, college uh, years, and um, you know, part of this will be a little bit of history as well, in terms of the history of, uh, of satellite-based astronomy. So does anyone recognize this, uh, this Satellite Huh? Uh, not quite that far in the wavelength. So this is the International Ultraviolet Explorer. Ah, yeah. So this was, uh, you know, other than Hubble, this is like the longest lived uh, space telescope ever. You know, it, it uh, was really astronomers only window in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum for the longest time. And, um, you know, the, the actual spectrum was on a little piece of thing, you know, it was about this big. The, the, so, you know, and, um, but it was a, a great window into, into the universe. It was up in space for 18 years. They originally ran it off just one gyro and like solar sensors and some other sensors and, you know, trying to, to point it. Um, and so it was really a, a, a feat of engineering and, um, and, uh, a, in, and innovation in terms of, you know, keeping this thing running. Uh, of course, you know, back then when I was in high school, this is the kind of type of equipment I was using. I was also on a BT-100. I had to go put magnetic tapes on to download the data because I was all do, doing all archival uh, research right now. So being the you know, high school student, I was like, go collect all this data, get it off the magnetic tapes, and then you know, run, some, run some programs. And so I was using this mini computer, right, the PDP-11. Um, eventually we got a back, so that was a really big, big deal. Uh, and then this is actually on display in the Smithsonian uh, National Air and Space Museum in Chantilly, Virginia. Um, so that makes me feel comfortable. <laughs> so what we're doing there, uh, we are looking at uh, spectra of certain uh, late B and early A stars, looking for circumstellar disks. So looking at highly ionized species, um, carbon-4, and so looking for 
Uh, and to distinguish it from interstellar medium, we were looking for variation over time. So this is why IOE was great, because there have been lots of obs observations over time. Uh, and so you know, this is a, you know, something that got published in, in APJ eventually. Um, and looking over you know, the course of several years, you can see how these, uh, you know, the, these uh, shift as to, depending on the, the circumstellar winds. And so we identified a few you know, new uh, stars that had these type of circumstellar winds. <coughs> so this is you know, before all this sort of you know, looking for planets nowadays, you know, but this is like you know, the low-tech version of looking for protoplanetary systems. That was pretty high-tech back then. It was high-tech back then, right. What's so, wrong with a PDP a lot of it? computer. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's a 10 megabyte disk, you know. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So eventually, if there was, instead of using magnetic tape, I could you know, do a dial-up into Goddard um, by the phone to, to get the data off the, you know, the, our, off the hard drives, which was a really big, uh, big deal. So I did a little bit of work there. And then another, one other summer, I also worked on this. Does anyone know what this is? It's not Kobe. It is Kobe. Oh, okay. This is the Cosmic Microwave, uh, Cosmic Background Explorer. And of course, everyone you know, hopefully knows that it won the Nobel Prize in 2006, right? John Mather and George Smoot. Uh, Dave Wilkinson probably would have been on there if he hadn't died in 2002. Um, but uh, so my contribution to this was you know, a little bit of IDL code here. So this was like to project, because Kobe had this really weird projection. It was a cubicle projection, so like the map of the sky was projected onto a cube, and then I had to convert that to something that someone, like a normal person, could actually visualize. Um, so I did these, you know, projections, and the computers were so slow that I had to pre-calculate all of the, um, you know, all the coordinate transformations and store them on the hard drive, which was great, which was, you know, great to have, uh, and at various resolutions depending on what resolution the user wanted to, to look at, you know, what resolution their screen was at. It, was, it would like take too long to calculate on, you know, these projections on the fly. Anyway, so you know, I, I, I really like. You know, several different programs to, to do these map projections. Um, this is the only one that survived. That um, you know, so it was then modified in 1992 by some other uh, contractor. So you know, if you look in the um, in the Kobe archives, like this one program has many links. <laughs> so what did I accomplish? So I, I did get a couple of articles in FJ with my name on it. You know, from the IUE stuff. So that was always cool. Uh, which of course helped, you know, was great for my resume in terms of getting into college, getting into graduate school. Um, I contributed a few lines of code to a Nobel Prize winning project, so you know, I was like the little dot, you know, little speck of dust in there. Um, but more important is what I learned. So I learned some programming, IDL and tech. Does anyone use IDL anymore? A few people, good. Okay, it's still around. Probably the GNU version or something since it's cost so much. Um, I, I programmed in tech, you know, not LaTeX. This was plain tech, right? This is really like running a program to print out your paper. Um, and I learned that data entry and analysis was very tedious, very time-consuming, uh, but also very extremely important. You know, none of the work could have been done without all this tedious, tedious work. Um, did it for making good figures. I think I spent several weeks on that figure that ended up in FJ, like going back and forth. Now I'll do this. This will be, you know, change that spacing there. And this was a lot of work back then, right, on a PDP 11 to do. Um, but there are a lot of data that's out there, probably not in magnetic case anymore. Hopefully, they've been transferred to something, uh, something uh, you know. The magnetic case might be more durable than uh, than, um, than uh, hard drives. But anyway, there's discoveries waiting to be to be to be made out there if there's someone willing to look. And then finally, I'm old enough to have stuff that I work on in a museum. So that's, that's well, something. <coughs> that's so from there, um, went off to Princeton to get my PhD. Um, and so this is astrophysics phase two, what I did in grad school. So probably, how many of you are PhD students? Most of you, okay. Any postdoc? Yeah. One postdoc, all right. That's why you get to organize the seminar. <laughs> so, so okay, taking classes, taking, passing exams. Uh, I did, you do, we are required to have an experimental project in, to, in order to begin your actual PhD work. So Dave Wilkinson was my advisor for this. I was evaluating this sort of material that was supposed to be used to help, you know, maybe electronically switch between polarizations as opposed to doing physical switching. It failed completely miserably. I was on the roof of Jad Hall all summer in, you know, the, the um, 
and the humidity of, of central New Jersey. And you know, eventually, I, I found, looking back, I saw that the previous grad student had con confused millimeters with mils. So you know, that's several orders of magnitude difference in terms of the thickness of the material required. So of course it was going to fail. But I didn't catch this until it was too late. Well, fortunately, even a failed experimental project counts towards you know, this, you know, you know, this requirement. So I was able to you know, move on. So this kind of you know, turned me off to experimental work a little bit. So I decided I wanted to do cosmology theory for my PhD and got uh, Jerry Ostrock here to uh, be my, my advisor. So one of the first projects I worked on was, does anyone even think about textures anymore or other cosmological? Yeah, probably defects, probably not. So, but back then there were, you know, textures and cosmological strings and monopoles were still like active research in terms of whether they might have seeded the initial perturbations uh, in the universe. Um, so, of course, structure grew out of small seed perturbations. This was after Kobe, we knew that there were these perturbations out there. But were these perturbations Gaussian or non-Gaussian? So inflation generally predicts, you know, Gaussian perturbations, whereas things like topological defects, um, cosmic uh, strings and textures, they would produce non-Gaussian ones. And so these are some, you know, 3D uh, cosmological simulations. So, but how could we maybe empirically probe this before, you know, WMAP and Planck and all these, you know, high precision cosmology uh, type work? So you know, the, the um, basic insight is that, you know, regular galaxies are kind of common events, right? So they probe the middle of the probability distribution um, not far, but X-ray clusters are, are sort of rare tail events. So maybe we could use this, you know, this comparison to see, you know, given what the um, you know, typical perturbations, the size of that is, you know, are the, um, uh, what's the, does the abundance of X-ray clusters seem to be, you know, match with more Gaussian or non-Gaussian uh, uh, distribution. So this is you know, basically, you know, for textures, you have this much more heavier tail in the distribution as opposed to a Gaussian distribution. And so we looked first at regular galaxies, looking at their peculiar velocity, the deviation from the Hubble flow, um, as a measure of what are typical perturbations. And so does anyone recognize that satellite? Uh, sort of? That's uh, IRAS, so oh. infrared astronomy. So it look the same. <laughs> well, <laughs> so this was, you know, so I used um, several different sources of peculiar velocity maps to try to get a measure of the um, of the uh, sort of peculiar velocity uh, per size perturbation. And then we looked, uh, used data from this satellite, so X-ray clusters, so it has to be X-ray, X-ray. Right? So, but anyway. Hmm? This is the ROSAD. So, um, so uh, to look at sort of the tail, tail perturbations and then the temperature distribution, you know, at you know how many uh, clusters are there above a certain uh, certain temperature. So uh, first up here, there's a, there's multiple studies and surveys, so I try to combine them, you know, not just using my favorite um, my favorite survey. Um, so you know, I essentially reinvented a random effects statistical model, not knowing it. Uh, and none of the reviewers knew it either. So, um, uh, uh, so, so you know that made it innovative. Um, and then higher temperature uh, clusters, uh, I you know used a method to sort of fit a distribution function, and essentially reinvented statistical survival analysis. I hadn't taken any statistics class at all, so um, so this was uh, and this was pre World Wide Web, remember? So I couldn't just like look it up on Wikipedia. Um, so. Uh, and again, the you know, reviewers didn't, you know, didn't know that this was reinventing something that statisticians had invented earlier either. Um, and then I used Bayes factors uh, to compare Gaussian versus texture models as to how well they, uh, those distributions fit. Um, uh, so the results, it, you know, slightly favored Gaussian models were, you know, two or three fold kind of Bayes factor, but not definitively. Um, of course, this was later independently. Um, uh, confirmed that it was Gaussian by the, the CMB measurements. So then the, the next part of my uh, um, dissertation was uh, modeling the heating reionization. There's a reason why I'm going through all this, right? It'll come back later. Um, so I used the, developed a semi-analytic model um, for the evolution of sort of reionization reheating uh, in the universe where the first stars, you know, uh, H2 bubbles, and then eventually the bubbles percolate and then they, they combine. Um, and then, so why a semi-analytic semi model? Well, first, 
you can explore a much larger region of parameter space in terms of, high, um, in terms of cosmological parameters using a semi-analytic model rather than sort of the 3D hydrodynamic simulations, which you know, were you know, just sort of becoming mature at that point, and I, I don't actually even know what their, what their status is nowadays. Um, so again, looking at Gaussian versus texture models, so up, up here is the Gaussian model, down here is the texture model. You know, because of the higher tail perturbations, you get earlier reheating um, in, in, the, in the universe. Um, and so that's pretty pretty evident from these two different uh, different graphs. And then different levels of omega get slightly different uh, results as well. So um, and it also provides a reality check. So you know, Jerry was like, you put all this stuff into the hydrodynamic simulation, but how do you know that the answer is really making any sense? Because you know, you just kind of you you think you have all the equations right, you think you have the initial conditions, and, and then it just sort of spits out an answer at the end, right? So this provides kind of a reality check. Are we getting sort of the similar order of magnitude between the semi-analytic model and the, the hydrodynamic simulation? Um, and then, but of course, the most important reason was because I was running out of funding, and I'm, everything else was failing. So I needed to get, you know, get my get done and graduate. Um, so I actually spent the, you know, a couple months in the summer without any funding, just finishing this off. Um, so. anyway, they're kind of brutal about saying, you know, when you're done, but you got to get out of here. Yeah. So, so what did I accomplish? So while I did get a PhD, which was really nice, um, another a couple of articles published. Um, where I learned I didn't want to be an experimentalist. You know, I'm still not an experimentalist. I don't go in the lab. They don't let me play with pipettes or anything like that. Um, I did, you know, learn some numerical programming. Um, learn the failure is okay, and sometimes it's even necessary for success. So, especially for you bad students, you know, failing is is not um, is is uh, is not optional. You have, you know, occasionally you have to fail in order to succeed. Uh, uh, more substantively, you can combine data from independent sources to get new in insights. Um, you know, the, the, early, the um, earlier work on the um, X-ray clusters and field velocities, uh, as well as some work I'll talk about in, in a little bit, uh, is all about combining independent data sources that have sort of different slices of parameter space. Uh, and then, you know, I really grew to love Bayesian statistics. I don't know how you all feel about it, but to me, it seems much more intuitive to think about the probability density you know, what's your uncertainty of a particular parameter rather than the frequentist? Well, if I ran this experiment many times, what's the sampling distribution of what I would get? And what's the distribution of right? that, that just sort of is not very intuitive. So that that was um, you know my PhD work, but you know there there is this overlap here. So I did start doing some science policy work even while I was getting my PhD, um, and this was sort of the start of my dual personality period. So my other graduate school experience was at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs, um, and they had this program called the Science, Technology, Environmental Policy Certificate Program. So there are several professors in this program at the WU who were actually PhD physicists. One's Frank von Hippel, who did a lot of work on nuclear proliferation, non-proliferation, um, and then uh, Dan Kamen, who's now at Berkeley, but he did some work on risk analysis, and now he's more into energy type stuff. So it seemed, uh, so, you know, Dan had actually worked on a Bell Cluster, so I was like, oh my goodness, somebody who does stuff that's similar to me. Um, and, you know, so it seemed like an interesting alternative to career to, to consider. Um, I could get a certificate by taking four courses and writing a policy paper, so that didn't seem uh, too bad. Um, uh, Jerry, my advisor, became provost while I was getting my PhD, so he didn't seem, you know, to mind exploring things outside of astrophysics, and he was doing it himself, right? He was, those while, while still advising students, so I don't think he ever slept. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, the most important reason is because I was dating someone who was a, who was a master's <laughs> stuff in this uh, public policy school. So, yeah. so my certificate project was I looked at uh, different models of uh, to fit tumor data uh, in animals exposed to various carcinogens. Um, and you can see the two models: one's uh, you know solid line, one's a dashed line. I talked about implications of different models and approaches, um, and then made some recommendations as to what EPA should do, you know, on a routine basis in terms of fitting, uh, fitting uh, these types of models. So this science is, of course, much simpler than anything I was doing for my PhD. And so I was like, wow, this is easy. Um, and you know, and then you know, this actually might have some impact on what people do and, and regulations and you know, affecting human health. So I was like, wow, this could be much more impactful. This one. Thing I'm doing at the Wu could be more impactful than my, all my dissertation work. Um, 
So, you know, so what did I what did I accomplish? I got my certificate. Um, even got an article published uh, in Risk Analysis Journal. Um, spent a lot more time with my future wife than I would if I, if I hadn't done this. Um, and then, you know, I learned that science policy could be a career option. You know, there were these PhD physicists who were doing uh, work on public policy. Um, then my physics training could, you know, give me sort of a competitive advantage against all the other people who were doing policy stuff. Um, you know, I could kind of maintain this dual personality finishing my PhD uh, while, you know, doing this uh, policy work. Uh, and that impact is not necessarily correlated with complexity or technical difficulty. So, you know, when you make impact in the wider world, oftentimes it's, there might be a lot of technical stuff underneath it, but, you know, ultimately making that final translation isn't necessarily, it's almost impossible if it's super highly technical and, and, and too complicated. So this is where I was at sort of a crossroad. So I have my physics PhD, I have my STEP certificate, now, now what do I do? So I could get a postdoc, you know, could go anywhere in the world, go get a postdoc. Um, I could go into industry. You know, Slumberger was actually was actually here on Thursday. They have a building somewhere on campus. Right? Um, they, um, you know, they're an oil uh, oil services firm. They are recruiting at, uh, at, um, for PhDs and postdocs. Uh, consulting was another uh, you know, avenue. They were also recruiting you know, physicists from um, McKinsey. Um, finance. You know, this was before the before the financial crisis, even before the first financial crisis back in 2000. Um, so you know, they were you know. Looking for you know people with great math skills to do financial engineering and to cause future financial crisis. So um, <laughs> and then there's you know policy. So you know, AAAS has these policy fellowships. Um, EPA. Um, this is the you know the, uh, Congress. So some of the options I looked at. So I wasn't really interested in finance. You know several of my classmates did end up in that field. Um, they you know just didn't 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 call me. No, from physics, actually. From physics, uh, some, some folks ended up there. Um, Slumberger, I wasn't really interested in horizontal drilling. You know, I was like, why would you want to do horizontal drilling? You know, so obviously, I, I didn't have the intuition as to, you know, fracking at the time. Uh, they were doing, like, NMR on the drill tip, and, you know, so they were recruiting, you know, recruiting physicists to, to, you know, make that better so they can figure out where the oil was. Um, now, several castmates, including a postdoc who was a stream theorist, ended up at, at some reason. I don't know if they're still there now, but they were still went there for a while. Uh, McKinsey, I actually did apply for consulting. It seemed like, oh, we can work on all sorts of different problems, um, applying your skills. Uh, I made it to the second round, but I was kind of too nice. Like, I wasn't willing to, like, close that factory because it seemed like they could just break even. So, you know, you should have just canned them. So, uh, and I was too researchy. I was like, always wanted to wait, more, wait for more data before making decisions. Uh, but several classmates in the postdoc ended up there. One of the postdocs, Tom Herbig, he had you know, worked on several CMB satellites, uh, CMB experiments like down up in you know, Saskatoon and maybe and down in, uh, in South America. Uh, he ended up like there for like 15 years before now he has he's, like some senior person at, at some uh, more boutique consulting firm. So and he had really nice suits when I saw him. You know, the next time after that. Uh, a AAAS Science Technology Policy Fellowship at EPA. So I didn't actually apply to this um, because I thought it didn't feel like I was qualified. I hadn't really done anything environmental other than my little project. And you know, it seemed like they were looking for something, you know, from their job des their description of these fellowships, um, you know, it didn't seem like I really fit. But that, that was a complete mistake. Because later when I was at EPA and I was like looking for these AAAS policy fellows, I was like, we'll take anyone we, we can get who has any, you know, who has you know good scientific skills. Uh, is it, you know, several of these policy fellows ended up, you know, with permanent jobs and, or going off to, to um, you know, either work in industry or you know stay at EPA, you know, as, as scientists. So, you know, so that, that that was a mistake. So you know, remember that when you're applying for jobs. <coughs> Just go for it. Uh, so there is also this congressional fellowship. This, this is where um, you work for a staff member in Congress, uh, also sponsored by AAAS, um, and you know that you know that's really high paced, uh, you know, uh, really you know, exciting type of work. Um, you know, making memos, you know, helping the staff, you know, prepare for hearings, things like that. Um, I made it to the final round, but wasn't selected for that. Um, and then I applied for the GAO, the General Accounting Office. Uh, and so this was the only job offer I had. So you know, I was like, I guess I'm taking that one. 
So this is uh, going to, to GAO. So um, and you know my wife had another job in DC, so we got married in between there. Um, and uh, and so you know it it, it, it seemed like a, a reasonable reasonable start. So what was life at GAO like? So uh, it was basically writing writing reports for Congress. So GAO is an investigative arm of Congress. Congress you know first requests. Um, Request some investigation to be done of something in the executive branches, and you know they think it's going wrong, so you have to go investigate it. Um, you develop some clear objectives, scope, and methodology uh, for your uh, for your uh, report. Um, you go out and get evidence. You fly around, coach class, um, to you know interview people, to collect data, to you know do site visits, um, do analysis, evidence, draw conclusions. And then you write a draft report. So one of these was on chemical biological defense uh, research, uh, R&D programs. Uh, another one was related to Agent Orange. Um, so the Air Force had this uh, study of these ranch handers, people who actually sprayed Agent Orange in Vietnam. And they followed them you know, epidemiologically over the you know, course of several decades. And, and you know, the Viet veterans groups were like, they're hiding the data. They're, you know, we can't trust the Air Force to study their own people. And so we went into basically do an investigation and audit. Uh, and then there's one other report that's secret, so, I, so there's no, 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 nothing I can show you there. Uh, so you know, this part here is similar to scientific research, right? So you get a grant, or you, know, you, you, you know, develop a hypothesis, you develop methods, you get evidence, you analyze it, you write a report, right? So this is just you know, what, what we were all trained, being trained to do. So there's no pressure at this point no, it's actually completely independent. Yeah. Now, if you work in the, on the staff in, in Congress, I'm sure it's different. But this was meant to be kind of an arm's length. They send the request over. We, I mean, we briefed them on our progress and stuff like that. But you know, they were for this Agent Orange. They were looking at us for to really kill them, right? Um, but um, you know, it, all in all, it was a pretty well well run study. It had very low statistical power. It's only a couple thousand people. Um, so, you know, that, so one of the things I did for that report was to calculate power, the statistical power, you know, for various types of, of effects, just to show that you know it's a limited power. So, you know, there is this sort of spin as to is it absence of evidence or evidence in absence of effect, right? So, um, but so that was one of the communicate. So that's why I said it needs to improve communication. That's that's really the, the key there, not that their science was bad, it was how they communicated. But so the, the rest of developing a GAO report is you have every word of this report is verified by a third party, someone else at GAO. Like they go through all your evidence, all your data, my Excel spreadsheet with my power calculations. They had to verify every single thing, every single equation in there. Um, and then it goes through management review. So you know, not just your advisor, um, but you know, it's be like here, if not only your advisor, but also the dean, and then the provost, and then the chancellor also has to sign off on this report before it goes to Congress. Uh, and then you receive comments from the agency you just reviewed. Um, so they get to see a, an advanced copy of it. They send that comments. You have to respond to those. Um, uh, and then you get to publish it after all of this. So you know this is a level of scrutiny and, and much much exceeding any type of scientific peer review in terms of a journal. Right? So. Um, you know, so that was a bit of a bit of, bit of a shock, um, and you know they, they fixed your grammar too. Huh? Well, they did do that, but we actually had special training on how to write in the GAO style. So there's like a week of training in which you know they you know they have a certain style of writing which is really directed towards policymakers because policymakers don't want to read your introduction and your methods and your results. They want the conclusion at the end, and then if they if they don't agree with it, then they'll look at all the stuff after that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that sounds scary. So. A, little, a little bit of caricature, but, but not too much. So then there, was, then there was this moonlighting phase that I had. So, um, uh, so while I was doing these geo reports, I was moonlighting um, on nights and weekends. Those were for children, obviously. Um, and then uh, you know, finishing up, writing up work for my dissertation. A little bit of extensions, because you know, I was still kind of, am I staying in the policy realm or am I going to you know, go back? So I wanted to kind of keep my options open at this point. So does anyone know what this satellite is? WMAP, right. So this is the, well, originally called MAP, but then WMAP. Um, 
And so the, the first year data had just come out, you know, while I was at GAO, and you know, had some certain constraints on sigma A, omega, um, the optical depth, the last, um, last scattering, um, and then the, the Carnot spectral index, and, uh, and then people know what this is? This is the only ground based SDSS. Right. This is the only ground based thing. Right? Um, so this is SDSS, and it had constraints on a sort of different combination, you know, in terms of um, sigma A, uh, omega naught, and tau. And so if you just take the marginal parameter constraints, they appear inconsistent, especially for tau. So the original first year data for WMAP, this was like 0.13 or something like that. Uh, and then you know, the, the SDSS was, was from, the, um, from the quasar, it seemed like it was, it was below 0.1. Um, but you know, I used the Bayesian approach to sort of combine these data um, to devise sort of a, a harmonized, and it ended up with sort of harmonized consistent constraints across the two data sets, um, you know, taking into account some degeneracies, particularly in the uh, WMAP data, uh, that, you know, it is just the marginal constraints aren't, aren't really accurate because there's a correlation in terms of their, um, in terms of the length of it. So what did I, uh, what did I accomplish? I got a security clearance, unlike some people in the White House. Um, <laughs> I found a job in the same city as my wife, um, contributed to several GA reports, uh, I got to testify on your oath uh, in, in a congressional hearing. Um, you know, and you know, this is, so I have to credit my, my supervisor at GDO because he really encouraged that his staff who did the work should be up there at the table like responding to the Congress and not just him up there taking all the credit, which is kind of more difficult. Um, got a few more articles published. Um, so, but what I learned, the, the first thing is that writing a government report is much harder than writing a journal article because just, it takes so much longer Oh, this is the degree of scrutiny, and this is it was true later when I was at EPA as well. Um, communicating with policymakers is very different than communicating with fellow scientists, right? It's, it's very you know, for GAO, it's a lot about written communication, like how do we, you know, how do we write in a way that people actually, like Congress, will actually read this report. And if, even the staffers, you know, they have they read the whole thing, but you know, they're you know overworked and underpaid. Uh, astrophysics moonlighting is kind of fun, but you know it's not really a sustainable lifestyle. Right? Um, I you know got some additional proficiency in Bayesian uh, approaches. You know this was when Marco Tam Monte Carlo was just starting to to take off. So I actually did that Bayesian analysis without Marco Tam Monte Carlo. I was like doing a grid. Yeah, it was it was a pain. Um, but uh, but I had my own little Linux computer you know in my basement. So. Uh, and then I, I really did believe in the mission of GAO in terms of. You know, making sure that the government uh, that is spending its money, it's doing, it's implementing its programs in an efficient and effective manner. Uh, but I did miss doing science. So then that sort of led me to, you know, this, uh, my longest step here is, uh, is being at EPA. And really the getting in the door was the hardest part. Because once you're in the door in one of these organizations, you know, if you, you know, are a performer, then, then you, you can, you know, you can, you can move around, you can go, Know, do lots of different things. So my end was radiation risk assessment. So you now I'm a physicist. You know, physicists know something about ionizing radiation. I had some experience in the policy <coughs> door, and so you know, I, I um, you know, it was an easy sell, you know, relatively for, for them to, to hire me into the radiation uh, program. Uh, and you know, the hiring official did have an open mind, and, and they did have PhD physics degrees as well. There is this thing called health physics, right, which is really about radiation protection. Um, so I didn't have a health physics degree, so all the health physicists didn't really like me. But you know, because my supervisor was was an actual you know, PhD physicist, you know, I, I made it in. And then after a couple of years, I moved into chemical risk assessment, and this is mainly a career um, kind of track thing. The vast majority of EPA deals with chemical chemicals, not radiation. Um, I had you know my PhD credentials still were still fresh enough that you know I had strong quantitative skills. I understood what an ordinary differential equation was. Um, you know, I could uh, do Bayesian analysis, you know, building on, on some of my radiation experience. So why did I stay at EPA for 14 years? So first, I, I did enjoy sort of the geeky side, right? Doing computational statistical analyses to uh, improve risk assessment. You know, there's you know, more and more biological data coming, uh, coming on, uh, over you know, this time period from 2000 till, till now. Um, I did, uh, you know, I understood something about science policy and about how to communicate with decision makers. So, in one of my first projects, I spent basically a year just briefing people about the project, which I had just taken over, which I hadn't done anything on, 
like they had been working on it for 10 years, and I was like briefing, uh, briefing uh, you know, senior people in NEP about it. Uh, and then there is the tree snack carter side, right? I really did believe in the mission to pr protect human health and the environment, and thought if I could use my skills to do that, that would, you know, I would that feel satisfaction. So why did I then leave EPA and, and, and join Texas A&M? Well, over that period that I was there, there EPA had really been under inc ever increasing political attack, both from outside, which was always there, but also inside the government. So, like, you know, Department of Defense. You know, Department of Energy, NASA, I mean, they're some of the biggest polluters, actually, you know, in terms of overall over the country. And so they didn't want EPA to, to like, find anything wrong either. Uh, you know, I became a supervisor, so I was spending, you know, I had managed a small group of, of people, but I was spending about 30 hours a week in meetings, you know, it's kind of like being a department head or something like that. Um, you know, management and planning meetings and responding to all these, you know, pressures from the outside. So I didn't feel like I wanted to spend the next, the last 20 years of my career in, in meetings all the time. Uh, so that, that was kind of the challenge to the EPA. Uh, and then a and really had a commitment to sort of rebuild its um, interdisciplinary toxicology program. Um, so it had sort of, you know, followed in terms of its reputation. They lost some big grants and they were kind of looking for mid-career people to bring in to kind of reinvigorate it. Um, and then it, it was really an opportunity to return to research, uh, develop some new methods and approaches. Uh, and I, I felt at this point that I could probably do more good outside EPA than inside. You know, I, I, and you know, that's a point that you know, every, you know, everyone has to make their own decision as to when that to be balance is you know, if you've been in an organization for a while. So whether it's publishing papers, being on advisory committees, things like that, uh, there's much more autonomy and freedom outside of, of the government. Uh, so that, that's what you know, led me here to, to a &M. So uh, that's kind of the first half. So the, the rest of this has no astronomy master physics in it. So just, just a disclaimer. Can I ask one question? Yeah. You hadn't been doing research for a while, and now you step into research. How far did you step this time? Was it, was it sort of seamless because you had been doing statistical analyses? You mentioned that you were an advisor going to lots and lots of meetings. And after a while, if you're not in the field, you can get stale. Right, so I, I try to actively maintain publishing papers in you know biomedical journals essentially, um, you know, doing these sort of Bayesian analyses and um, some modeling work that I'll, I'll show in a minute. Um, and I felt like I needed to do that to sort of maintain my edge, right? Or else I just become like a, another manager, like any other you know science manager, which is an important job. But you know, it, you know I liked doing that technical part of it, so I wanted to maintain that. Um, so I, I made an active effort to, to do that. So <laughs> that's the word. Um, so what is risk assessment? So this is so where, where I live is sort of um, you know at EPA it was it was in the middle here. Um, and it's really where you translate what's done in the research realm into helping make decisions about what to do um, in terms of policy, uh, whether it's you ban a substance. Um, we need to do more research, you know, that's the easy way out, right? Um, and then, you know, setting standards for air, water, um, and, and food, you know, safety, um, you know, how much uh, arsenic is allowed in your, in your drinking water, things like that. Um, and of course, this involves more than just science, but there's also socioeconomic and legal aspects as well. So the, the uh, middle, the, the two left, uh, the middle and the left part, scientific, is really where more of the science is. And you know it can be you can organize it kind of in this what we call a source to outcome continuum. Um, you start with some chemical getting released, some source of it is in the environment. It uh, gets transported through the environment so that it ends up in you know air, food, water, soil, etc. Then people get exposed to it; they come in contact with it. Uh, that they take it into their body. Uh, it you know circulates throughout the body, or it gets eventually excreted or metabolized in some way. That causes some biological changes, uh, and then ultimately there's some change in physiological or health status. Um, so this top part up here is called exposure assessment. You know, how do we get exposed? How does you know where the source, whether it's a coal fire power plant or something else, until it gets into your, your drinking water. Uh, and then this part down here is you know it has identification, which is more qualitative, like what can it do to you? And then dose response assessment, which is you know, how much of it will do how much of what to you. Uh, and then you put all this together into to a risk characterization. 
And this is really, these are you know, key inputs into how EPA accomplishes its mission to protect human health and environment. You need to know what these chemicals are going to do, how people are going to come in contact with it, before you decide on whether you need some sort of mitigation measures uh, or not. So I'm going to focus on this pharmacokinetics part because this is sort of my, where my entry point into this field was really. Um, and so what is pharmacokinetics? So, you know, if there's stuff out in the environment, first you have to absorb it into your body. So you could be through the skin, uh, uh, eating it or, or inhaling it essentially. Then it distributes throughout various tissues in the body. Uh, it can get metabolized. Your liver is, you know, essentially a big metabolizing organ. It transforms uh, chem you know, chemicals into other chemical species so that they can eventually get, um, get then excreted from the body, whether it, um, often in in urine, um, sometimes through the GI tract or, or uh, it's exhaled. So why is this important for risk assessment? Uh, first, the, the same amount out in the environment can lead to different effects uh, inside uh, a person's body um, or between different species. So, you know, mice and rats uh, are most of the experimental species. Uh, you know, are, we're, we're not just a big uh, rat, at least most of us. Um, and then, that, uh, you know, also people themselves differ. You know, everyone has different body weights, different body size, different metabolizing capability, um, different you know, activity patterns um, in terms of their uh, heart rates and, and, and such. So, um, so, so we need to account for the fact that we're all variable. We want to protect not just like the average person, but you know, we're trying to you know protect the, the vast bulk of the population. Uh, a second is that you know, typically you don't, you can't measure things at the, the tissue where you're going to have some toxic effect, right? If it's a, something that's going to affect your liver, you, people don't go routinely going around. Well, how much of you know chemical X is in my liver, right? You can do that in animal studies, but you can't really do that invasive kind of uh, assessment uh, in in humans. So you, we use models to you know estimate what's going to be you know in, in, at various tissues in your body. Um, so I think, and then. Uh, so again, you know, there's less data available in humans just because we generally don't. So for drugs, you know, people are going to get a benefit, direct benefit from drugs. So you test drugs in people. But for industrial chemical, you know, people aren't getting a direct benefit from being exposed to industrial chemicals, right? They're getting a benefit from the products that are being produced. But you know, you can't just go, well, let's test, you know, arsenic on people, or just, you know, or let's, you know, just, you know, you know test trichloroethylene or solvents and see what happens, um, because that, you know, there's no benefit. So that, that's you know clearly unethical. Um, so we have to use models as sort to, to make up for, uh, for that. Uh, and then lastly, you know, people are much more variable than laboratory animals. So we need again we need to account for that. So what we do, we approximate this human by basically just a set of compartments um, for different uh, for different organs. Some of the compartments get lumped together. Uh, we don't have to model every single you know, tissue in, uh, in the body. Um, and then this is basically just a set of ordinary differential equations. Um, it's already a vast simplification of the system, right? We assume each of these is a well-stirred um, box, essentially. Um, and but you know it's eight to ten uh, nonlinear equations because some of these processes, particularly for metabolism, are not are not uh, purely linear. Uh, dozens of parameters, and then we don't have a lot of measurements um, for each of these, so we need to fit these models um, to to you know fairly sparse data. Uh, like for humans, typically all we have is blood or air exhaling throughout the concentration. So, what are some opportunities for using these type of models? Well, first, they are based on you know scientific knowledge, right? They're not purely statistical fitting models. So, if you took a bunch of blood measurements, you could just fit a you know a curve fitting model to it. Um, but you know, we're trying to use a model that has some basis in, in reality, uh, in some physical reality. Um, you can make predictions. Um, that can be then compared to observations uh, that are constrained by the fact that we, you know, people don't have 100 kilogram livers, right? You know, there's only a certain range of size it could be. Um, we can make predictions that are not accessible to direct observation, particularly internal and things internal to the body. Uh, and so, therefore, we it, it facilitates you know taking laboratory uh, data on toxicity and how do we um, how do we extrapolate that to what might happen in the human. Being. So challenges that um, you know, parameters aren't necessarily are kind of known, but they're not known with with high precision. Right? So we, we don't have an MRI for every single person to see how big every single person's liver is. We have some general idea from cadaver studies as to the distribution. Um, there are many unknown parameters that are difficult to fit by maximum likelihood. 
um, and then data off of sparse of image. So you, um, and then finally, there is this variability problem. So everyone varies in all of these parameters simultaneously, uh, and for any particular data set, you don't know the specifics of that particular person that you measure. So this is really similar to what you know when we're using cosmological models, right? You're not directly observing omega naught, right? You're inferring omega naught from models of how the evolution of the universe and various um, uh, other types of uh, types of pro uh, types of processes. Uh, so there's many parallel issues, but they're just it's just in a different context. So you can sort of apply the same skills that uh, you know. The, so I could apply the same skills that I learned in you know doing my physics research to just, uh, just new problems um, in, in the biological space. So I'm gonna focus um, mostly on these two aspects here. Um, so the Bayesian approaches are actually a natural fit to address uh, these, uh, these challenges. Um, for these parameters that are kind of known but not known with great precision, we can do informative prior distributions. Um, for, uh, we can use Markov chain Monte Carlo to sample this multivariate um, parameter space, um, not using frequentist methods. Um, Bayesian methods can combine data from multiple data sets uh, together, just like, you know, between WMAP and SD, uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. You know, here we're talking about many more data sets potentially, but, it, you know, the principles are the same. Um, and then for this population variability, we can add a, another level of statistical um, hierarchical structure to it so that each person gets their own parameters it's just like a multiverse, right? So you have, you know, if we had, you know, our our universe is one, you know, sample from from the population of multiverses. So just like so, each individual is a sample from, um, you know, from a population of humans. So you basically combine these PPK models uh, with data, uh, with the statistical uh, Bayesian model, uh, do Markov chain Monte Carlo, have an ODE solver to solve this. Um, you know, solve the, the model for each set of parameters, um, and then you know, then you can uh, use your posteriors there to, to make uh, predictions. So, example uh, with with uh, this chemical trichloroethylene, which I worked on for many years at EPA. That you guys are probably too young to have seen this movie, right? So, I can, so anyway, this was about a, a contamination site back up in uh, Massachusetts, and uh, John Travolta plays a lawyer who's trying to you know, get compensation for these. Um, so TC has lots of different uh, effects, uh, both non-cancer non effects as well as cancer effects. Um, you know, Google is not immune to this, so there's toxic vapors in Google offices because so TC can get down into the groundwater, and then the vapors can come up to the basement essentially. Um, so what I basically did, I took you know about uh, you know surveyed the literature, I did a literature search, I found about 50 different uh, sets, of 50 different individuals. That had data on TC, um, you know, after exposure, uh, and then you know I modeled them using a you know Bayesian population model, and then depending on what uh, sort of toxic moiety we're talking about, what sort of um, you know this is the oxidation sort of this is a metabolism pathway, this is one of the metabolites, and this is a, a second uh, oxidate uh, a second um, metabolism pathway. You know, this is the amount of variability across individuals from the from a median person to a 95th percentile person. So some, uh, for some uh, toxic uh, endpoint, so for some, well these are what are called dose metrics, so measures of internal dose. Um, some, for some of these, uh, people are, are very similar because you know it's um, there's a lot of physiological constraints. Uh, but then for other ones, there's actually like this is about a seven-fold variation between the uh, 15th percentile and the, the 95th percentile. Individual. So you give the same, ex you expose them the same amount. Uh, like in drinking water, but you know the amount of toxic um, chemicals their body is, is producing from that could be seven times more in some you know in these more sensitive individuals than the typical person. And so this gets at you know this concept that you know toxicity in the population is, is part of, partly about predisposition, uh, but and as well as the external cause. So this sort of this idea of the gene environment interaction. I don't know if you've heard that sort of um, catchphrase before. But so, you know, the, you know, not everyone gets this reacts the same to an environmental toxicant. Um, some people have are more sensitive than others, and so this is a, a you know a key uh, challenge in risk assessment uh, to how how do we infer uh, 
make predictions about you know, our very heterogeneous population based on data that's typically in either a single strain of mouse or a single cell line. Um, and you know, there's, there's multiple challenges to making this, uh, this translation. So um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this. I can provide the slides for, um, for those who are interested. Um, so more recently, what I've been working on is taking some new population-based uh, approaches and tools that have been developed sort of on the experimental side and then developing models to try to utilize that. Uh, first, um, instead of single strains of rodents, there's a, now using a, basically multiple inbred strains to, to model a population. Um, one is the diverse, uh, called diversity panel, collaborative cross, I'll show you in, in a second. And then, you know, there's a lot of uh, induced pluripotent stem cell based technology um, where you can take samples of cells from many different individuals and then create liver cells or create heart cells from each of them so that you essentially can have uh, uh, do in vitro experiments in a population. So this is now uh, trying to basically take the human population and put them into a laboratory uh, and try to um, make that way have uh, more information about how much variability there, there might be. Um, so this is a statistical genetics exercise uh, in terms of how they took eight different strains of mice and then basically crossbred them uh, into these sort of mosaics in which they have several hundred of these now. Um, so now we have like basically reproducible individuals. Um, so it's like taking you and cloning you, uh, taking clones of you so we can do experiments on that clone of you multiple times uh, in the laboratory and then we have several hundred different individuals that we, that we clone. And you know, interestingly, you know, these, so this is just baseline variability. So this is how much these mice run on a treadmill uh, overnight uh, in one night, right? So some, these are couch potato mice down here, right? They, they run, you know, a few meters maybe. Right? And then these are the marathon mice, like, they're, they're just given this treadmill in their cage and they spontaneously, you know, they either like the exercise or they don't. And these guys, they're running like, you know, 20 kilometers in one night. Like, a con like this isn't like human equivalent, like these are, like mice this big running 20 kilometers. So um, those are they're definitely addicted to exercise. Um, <laughs> so, it, so so you know this is just baseline genetic variability, and so the the, the, the you know we really feel this is a very powerful tool to, to try to explore human variability because obviously people vary. You know there are some people who basically who run marathons, and maybe not every day, but and then there are some people who sit on the couch all day um, or in front of them. Uh, so this is another example of why these types of models are useful. So um, they, they, uh, this is for Ebola. So um, you know, basically, you expose mouse Ebola to, um, to these mice, and they get various different types of reactions. Some, these, these are resistant. These are, um, it, it kills these ones with, uh, with liver problems. And um, yeah, and then, I'm sorry, the res these are resistant. And then these ones die from, uh, you know, they have they bleed out essentially. Um, whereas before, with just the inbred mice, uh, they, they were always here. So like, well, we can't use mice to, to explore Ebola. Uh, and then, so you, you essentially get a similar um, kind of qualitatively distribution of, you know, lethality versus um, you know, resistance, uh, and then how much are, uh, get this hemorrhage from in human Ebola cases as you do uh, in the, in the uh, mouse population. So you know, we tried to apply this idea to, again, with TCE. And so we looked at 17 different mouse strains. Um, and then you know, I developed the model to try to estimate that. And the bottom line here is just that you know, for these same internal dose measures, we're getting you know, the ratio, the model ratio between the 50th and the 95th percentile is very similar in the mice as it is in humans. So this is sort of proof of principle that we can use these sort of mouse models as a model for how variable uh, human beings are, and therefore, you know, have a better uh, um, means to protect, uh, you know, protect the more sensitive parts of the population. So, some other areas I'm doing um, some work on uh, complex mysteries after disasters. So, we actually got funded to look at chemical contamination after hurricanes a week after Harvey hit. Um, additional PPK modeling stuff. Um, 
some computational models to, to basically take some of these in vitro data and like translate them into what they might predict for an actual you know human health outcome. Uh, one here is uh, using cardiomyocytes, which is heart cells that actually uh, they're derived from uh, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, but they actually beat in a little dish, right? So they have a pretty poor well played. They, they actually beat synchronously, and they can measure the beating. And if you look at the beating patterns, and if you treat them with things that are bad for heart rate, they actually respond in the same way. And so developing a model to try to basically take you know, something from a dish and make a, uh, and make a prediction as to if you expose people to that in the population, you know, what would the aggregate uh, effects on cardiovascular um, uh, cardiovascular effects be. And then tools for doing what's called systematic review. This is reviewing the whole literature on a particular topic and then you know, systematically looking at, well, what is the bias, the particular uh, risk of bias for various different studies, because you know, different study designs will have different biases. Um, and then evaluating all the literature together uh, just to make a conclusion as to, you know, is this thing going to cause cancer in humans? Uh, is it going to cause reproductive or developmental effects? Um, so you know, a lot of the EPA's actual work is not so much doing the original studies, but reviewing the sort of vast literature that's been published and trying to synthesize conclusions out of it. So these all sort of contain to build on things that I learned um, during sort of my astrophysics phases of my journey, whether it's building computational models, uh, combining data from multiple different sources, gazing approaches. Um, but remembering that you have to balance sort of this complexity with the ability to translate results to people who actually will make some decisions. So just to summarize, so you know, I really enjoyed doing astrophysics, um, you know, but I did feel sort of a calling to do something, something different. Um, this transition, to, you know, to where I am now, took several intermediate steps. So it's not like you know, turnover tomorrow, you're going to do be in a different field. There's sort of a, you have to, you know, take incremental steps towards that. Uh, and in the middle, I was, you know, truly conflicted. I was trying to straddle both sides, and then eventually you have to have to make a decision. You have to break symmetry. Um, and then, you know, currently I, I, you know, enjoy, you know, integrating the sort of the science and the non-science parts of my training experience. Uh, but really, uh, it, it wouldn't be meaningful if it wasn't for like a meaningful purpose, which is to, to really protect human health and the environment. So the, I'll end then with, you know, some unsolicited advice based on this journey. You know, in the earlier parts of your career, um, you know, particularly grad school, postdoc era, you know, accomplishments are nice, but really focus on continuing to learn things. And you know, also learning how to learn things, learning how to learn you know things without being taught taught them, um, because you know having the, those you know a big skill set a toolbox you know will, will serve you well in the future. Uh, and you know similarly, you know things that you're learning here now are transferable to many other fields, not just you know environmental health, but as you saw you know earlier, you know, at the crossroads, there's many different areas where people are interested in, in physics. Uh, or people with that type of training. Uh, but it is important to believe in what you're doing because that's what motivates you to go to work every day and, and, and do that. And finally, just, just remember that life's a journey and not a destination. Okay? So enjoy, enjoy your time along with that. Okay, happy to take questions. Yeah. About your treadmill mice, was yeah. there any reward or punishment presented to them? It just no. like it's entirely up to them. Hey, there's a treadmill in my right. little so cage. Little, I can run little, if little, I feel like it. Exactly. So 19 kilometers for a mouse. Yeah. In a day. That's really amazing. I want the reference to that. Yeah, it was in the American Journal of Endocrinology or something like that. It, 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 yeah. But um, it's really amazing how just from genetic differences, these these mice have very different, you know, behaviors without like us trying without any. Outside influence. But it's such an incredibly wide range. Exactly. Many orders of magnitude from like the, you know, several. You know. Well, I, I've been a runner for almost 50 years. I have never convinced a non runner to start running. Mouse <laughs> or human. <laughs> Go ahead. It's not that important, but did y'all consider the possibility of hinges on the terminals? Um, they might be, they might be harder to turn one than, like, the, on the average, the average little treadmill might be harder to turn one than more. Yeah, I think they're fairly standardized. It wasn't my experiment. Yeah, so and they they, re, they did this. That was an average over three different nights. So it wasn't just one night. So you know these mice, the, the runners were consistently running, and the couch potatoes were consistently couch potatoes. So just 
just like you said. <laughs> Our field in physics and astronomy, there's kind of a pecking order as to what's the important research, what's not so important. And other conferences, especially large ones on the WAS, you really get this feeling that some people feel like they're doing more important than others. You must have, I don't know if you faced this, but do you face a bias in the fact that you decided to step away from this in physics and astronomy, and therefore the people that had PH, other PhDs in physics and astronomy that were working with you kind of look down at you because you were not doing what was the most prestigious thing. Is there that sort of bias in, in, in switching uh, careers at all? Or are you isolated from that because you really have, you're working with a completely different group? Yeah, so I've mostly been isolated from that. Um, although, so I did go back for Dave Wilkinson's Navarro service, um, and that was after I joined EPA. And, you know, all the, the you know, even Lyman Page, he was like, wow, you know, if I didn't, if I wasn't doing what I was doing, I would do something in the environment. So, uh, it, it, it's, I think there's also a realization that you know, there aren't enough academic jobs for all the PhDs that come out, and um, and you know these are at least most of them they're they're human beings who understand that there's more to life than than you know what they're um, what they're researching. But now I'm sure there's there's population variability in, in the, those sentiments as well. Yeah. When I was an undergrad at the University of Illinois, so this is the early '70s, mm -hmm. one of my professors said. If there is something other than astronomy that you're interested in, my advice is do that other thing, because it's too hard to get a job in astronomy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So even in our program, right, in our cosmology program, we advise them and we train them to get jobs like in uh, whether it's in government or a consulting firm or a chemical company or you know state government NGO. You know, we discourage them from going into academic toxicology. Um, unless, you know, so they have to get over that activation energy and really want that in order to stay. Just, you know, NIH funding levels are, are terrible. Um, and, it, you know, the, the typical, um, so I, you guys probably don't know. Today they canceled W first, did you see? Wait, what? what? Okay, yeah. yeah. No. Wait, no. what? No, they didn't. The president said, I want to cancel W first. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> which, 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 like those presidential budget requests, yes. have less power than President Trump's tweets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I'm, I'm glad it's not as bad as it seemed when I came in. Well, so the, the typical biomedical researcher gets their, their first what, R01 grant, which is their individual investigator initiated grant, in their median age is like in their 40s. That's a long time to wait to get, and that's like what what departments want to give you tenure, right? So that, that that's a long slog. So I skipped all that by going into government <laughs> and then coming here mid career. So um, not to say that you know it, obviously everyone can't do that, but you know I wasn't looking for this job. Um, it sort of I was re you know, recruited for it by another colleague who was moving here. Um, so you know, part of it, as I mentioned in one of my slides, is there's luck involved in terms of where you, where you end up. And, you know, and it's good to be employed. Right, it is good to be employed. <laughs> but when there are opportunities, you know, you, you should also, they may not come again, so you should, you should take them. Any other questions?